need uh, at any given point may be a little bit off. Um, as your physiological alertness um, can go down after time of, not be of being awake, your subjective alertness often stays quite high. So there are times when you feel like, oh, I'm really awake. I can totally work on this paper. I can totally get all the way to like Portland tonight. It'll be fine. But your physiologic alertness is going down almost monotonically with time awake. Like not 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 time like total time awake, but like once you've gotten started getting tired, your alertness goes off uh, goes off quite quickly. Um, and so that's something to be aware of. Another thing to be aware of is that your need for sleep changes over the course of your life. So as people age, the total amount of sleep that they get, uh, that people get, um, goes down. And this is a meta-analysis over a number of different uh, different studies that shows that shows there's this nice decrease over life. And not only is time total time spent asleep changing over the course of life. Also, the uh, type of sleep changes. There's a, spent a lot less time spent in rapid eye movement dreaming sleep over the course of life. That also decreases uh, with age. So the, the quality of life changes. But I must say, at this RSI type time interval here, note that this is much higher than, say, the staff type time intervals in here. <laughs> and they were the ones actually going to bed because they learned that they actually need to do some of that. So why might they need to do that? Um, so one uh, thing that sleep contributes to is to overall physical health. Um, if you are sleep deprived for too extended a period that does lead to uh, things like illness and death, usually it's due to um, depressed immune system, so that you just generally other things get to you. But specifically, there's been some work looking at the effects on the brain um, due to uh, sleep. One result that came out earlier this week in Science Magazine was um, was a result showing that one thing that happens during sleep is actual removal of toxins from the brain. So here's just a slice of, of mouse brain tissue where they've uh, put some tracer in, uh, in, uh, in the blood supply there and looked to see how well it diffused. And then uh, this, this, red, er, this reddish yellowish area here is the diffusion while people are, well, sorry, while the mouse is awake whereas the green area is the diffusion while the mouse is asleep. So there's a much better um, diffusion of cerebral spinal fluid, which clears out toxins. In particular, they looked at beta amyloid, which you may have heard of a connection with Alzheimer's, because in Alzheimer's disease, there's a, there is a large buildup of beta amyloid that we don't know what the causal relationship is. But if you look at the amount of beta amyloid that's present in the brain, uh, it's a normal byproduct. Um, but it gets cleared out more effectively during sleep than during wake. Um, so this is one uh, advantage there. It also, this red line here is also cleaned out while the mouse was, uh, had a lot of ketamine in its system, but that's another talk entirely. <laughs> uh, just a thing to take away here is that there's starting to be some evidence for actual like uh, regulatory and cleanup mechanisms happening during sleep. Uh, some other uh, more uh, helpful science related to sleep is of, of learning. Sleep actually plays an active role in the maintenance uh, and ret retention of information. Uh, work on this started way back um, in 1924. This is one of the, the seminal studies on sleep. They had uh, two poor individuals uh, memorize lists and lists and lists of nonsense syllables, and then they tested them at varying degrees. And so their retention of nonsense syllables goes down over time, um, over wake. But when, when people went to sleep, they saw that people retained, that these, uh, these two poor volunteers retained more of these nonsense syllables uh, when they had a chance to sleep right after learning them than when they were staying awake. Um, suggesting that sleep has some sort of functions for helping you retain information that you learned while you were awake. And beyond just helping you retain, there's some evidence from skill learning literature that sleep actually improves your ability for learning um, uh, skills and other rhythmic behaviors. So if you can imagine that you're typing with your left hand here on a keyboard, the number is 41324 over and over. So this is the task here. So that people typing just this little basic sequence over and over and over again, see how fast they could do it. Um, and so they showed that Immediately post training, people could type about um, 
about 22 sequences per 30 seconds. But when they retested people the next day, they'd gotten about 20% better. So they'd improved overnight. And in the control studies, they showed it wasn't just the passage of time. So when they trained people in the morning and tested them at night, they didn't get any better. But they got significantly better when they tested them the next morning, suggesting that for these uh, for rhythmic motor behaviors, which you could you know, uh, that there was like a significant improvement just due to sleep. And while this was a very simple little typing task, you can imagine that it doesn't take too much to scale this up to say learning a piece on the piano or learning um, some maneuver in sports or any or any number of other uh, fine motor skills. Um, so you can get better at many of these things simply by taking a good night's sleep. So good, get your six or so hours in there to get a 20% boost in, import, in improvement. All right, another uh, topic that often comes up with sleep is dreaming. Um, and when most people think about sleep and dreaming, they think of this gentleman here, Sigmund Freud, who said a lot of interesting things about dreams and what they mean. That's not the cutting edge of scientific thought on dreaming right now, but it still captures the imagination that you go into this period of hallucination and then forget most of it, and you know this is normal. That happens to most people most nights. Um, but why does this happen? Why do we have these really uh, bizarre um, recombinations of the events of the day, or of history, or of, or of fiction? Uh, one of the current thoughts on this relating to learning is making connections. Not making connections between obviously related things, but making further connections. That fourth page of Google hits, as it were. Um, so one interesting study on this by a different Helen Bogan than we heard from earlier um, showed participants uh, these sort of fractally images, just as, as random things, and they showed them in pairs. So, for example, they'd see these two and they'd have to respond which one was better. And there was some secret one that was chosen by the experimenters beforehand. Participants learned that association. They saw those two, and then they'd see a different pair and they'd learn that, and they'd see a different pair and learn that. And they're always seeing these pairwise. Uh, but unbeknownst to them, there was a hierarchy. So A was always better than B, B was always better than C, and so on. So there was, they were presented with this hierarchy, but always at a pair at a time. And when they tested people on the pairs that they'd seen, people were very good at that. They learned that. Uh, but, when they but then they'd also test them on these first degree pairs that were separated. They'd never seen these two together. And they'd definitely never seen these second degree pairs together, which were uh, further apart. Um, and so they tested people on like I said, these first degree pairs and second degree pairs after 12 hours after um, they first uh, did the experiment. And people were OK at this. Um, they were uh, above chance. So they learned something there. Oh, but, they, uh, but they learned a whole lot more after sleep. So either after a 12-hour interval that included sleep or a 24-hour interval that included sleep, especially these second-degree pairs, because we're almost perfect at realizing the relationship between there. So they've been able to make these sort of long-distance connections in the hierarchy uh, due to a good night's sleep that they didn't have over the same period of wake, suggesting that something about sleep, and in, in later studies they've said this particularly is related to REM and dreaming sleep, if you deprive people of REM, they don't have this sort of uh, this sort of connections being made. So you, um, there's some ch some thought that maybe taking uh, ideas, putting them together, and saying, are these related? Do these go together? Uh, maybe one of the functions of dreaming and helping you make those uh, long range connections. So like I said, sleep is an important part of RSI. Um, and the relationship with sleep. This summer I had the, uh, the privilege of going to Saudi RSI and I saw that sleep is also very important there, <laughs> as my tutor group will attest to. Um, I had every day when they came back and were from mentorship and were exhausted, I always had to decide like, do I make them do their work or do I let them take a nap? And so I came to the conclusion that they should finish their journal entries for the day and then they could take a nap. And this mostly worked out just fine for them because I realized that it's important for them to make connections for the, all the things they learned during the day. Um, 
And you know, like RSI, there's a whole lot of uh, people falling asleep in the library, working on their papers as things get toward the end. But one particular curveball that was thrown at us was the inclusion of Ramadan. Um, and so in the month of Ramadan, uh, there's fasting during the day. So between uh, sunrise and sunset, observant Muslims are not supposed to uh, let anything pass their lips, food or water, which when it's uh, over 100 degrees outside is very difficult. Um, and so this was very hard on the students who are trying to do very difficult science. And in the country in general, there's a big shift in the schedule. So one way to make the fast less painful is to sleep all day. And our students thought, even more than our RSI students, who thought we were terrible for making them wake up in the morning, the SRSI students thought we were really terrible for making them be awake at all during the day, much less the morning. Um, so uh, we, had, we instituted something that I think should be a model for all of RSI, which is nap time. <laughs> the afternoon nap was one of the better features, I think, of, of uh, Ramadan and helped us keep our spirits in the evening uh, as, and enjoy the Ramadan festivities, um, as uh, former RSI director Mark Saul was doing there. Um, so I mentioned in my title that um, there is a possible upside to not having gotten enough sleep during RSI. And this is a bit of a dirty little secret of summer camps, boot camps, and other, uh, other large groups of people. And that is one thing that comes along with sleep deprivation, besides not remembering things very well, is a certain emotional lability, as they would say, or going from very happy to very sad, to moving all back and forth. But this actually leads to social bonding pretty easily, because it breaks down some of the barriers between people, and it makes it easier for people to sort of share in the emotion of the moment together, and it can lead to friendships that uh, are nicely well cemented by a shared experience of strong and passionate emotion. So that's worked well for me as you know, you can make groups of friends that last well together. And so I hope that you all were able to make some friends in your sleep deprived state during RSI like I did. And I'd like to thank you for staying awake during my talk. <laughs> How many hours do you need? And is it better to get more? Um, let's see. Uh, it varies person to person, I'll say, but usually somewhere in the neighborhood of eight hours. Um, but some people, some people only really need four or five, but that's the distinct minority. So at least six, usually about eight. But it does vary individual to individual. <coughs> and um, you know, at some point, you can't stay asleep any longer, and you'll just wake up, and that's pretty good. So don't, don't force yourself to sleep longer if you can. Yeah. So you say some people need less? Like, how does one determine? Because, like, one can function very usefully on less, but for a while? But that for a while. Be a bad idea. Right. Um, so there are some people who are short sleepers, but they generally know because they usually have a parent who's a, who's a seriously short sleeper. Um, there are some people who just wake up after five hours and or can't, you know, sleep, can't fall asleep if they uh, haven't been awake for you know, 27, 28 hours, something like that. But it's, uh, that's usually a lifelong thing, and it's not a, a short-term thing. And they generally don't need as much caffeine to keep going at that, <laughs> at that level. Yeah. Uh, so I actually had two questions. The first is, you mentioned that REM cycles were what was important. So I was wondering if you can comment on like, how far after your like, initial going to sleep? Does the first REM cycle kick in? How long was that? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, so sleep follows a typical pattern, which is there, there are several different stages that when you, uh, assuming you're well rested, uh, or like on a normal cycle, um, when you first fall asleep, you go into light sleep, and then go into progressively deeper sleep. Um, and then um, as you sort of return to light sleep, you'll go through dreaming phase. So a typical sleep cycle lasts about 90 minutes and you get both light sleep and deep sleep and REM sleep, uh, or dreaming sleep in all of that. Um, and so you get less um, dreaming sleep in the beginning of the night and more towards the end of the night. Um, and you get more deep sleep at the beginning of the night than at the end. So deep sleep is 
Also, like if you just catch a 20 minute nap because you're exhausted, you're probably getting mostly deep sleep in that because that's one of the things you get strongest pressure on. Um, so you get an increasing amount of REM sleep as you go through the night. Um, and so when you wake up in the morning and you sort of remember your dreams, part of the reason is because you're getting more of that in the, in the later part of the night. Yeah. yeah. I've been told that you know sleep often falls into uh, maybe two, three or four hour cycles and that's consistent with my own experience too. Yeah. And I'm also told that uh, before uh, electricity, people used to kind of break those two cycles and have uh, you know, first sleep and second sleep or something with some stuff going on in between. Uh, you any I've, thoughts into how that, you know, whether that's true first and um, whether I've, that I've read about it, but it I'm only in sort of popular accounts. I haven't read any, any of the scientific literature on that, but um, I can imagine, like, because we have these sort of like, um, these uh, you know, 90 minute cycles, it would be totally reasonable to have a couple of those, wake up and have a couple more between, it's very easy to wake up between cycles and harder to wake up in the middle of them. Um, so that strikes me as very plausible, but I don't know any specific results on it because we weren't studying sleep nearly the same way when uh, that was purportedly going on. What does this sleep expert think about cultures that take siesta to naps during <laughs> Well, um, certainly for me, it was really nice this summer um, when I was, uh, uh, it, it, you know, it made a lot of sense when it's the hottest part of the day, like I couldn't get much thinking done during that point anyway. So, ha you know, there are a lot of people who take regular naps. Um, I think well over half of university students regularly take naps. So it's there's that, a lot of that going on in that in culture too. And so, certainly, you know, if your choice is take a nap or don't get as much total sleep, I say take the nap. I don't think there there's nothing. That I've seen that su suggests that it's in any way bad as long as, uh, you know. Um, yeah, I think, well, gen generally having people, you know, happier and more productive is probably a good thing. Um, so I would generally, generally suggest that. And it was kind of interesting um, when I was at Saudi Arsai to go to the mall at 11.30 p.m. and have there be a lot of people out there. Like, if the whole culture shifts to sort of work, you know, sort of agree on that, then you're not working against things and that works out a lot better. So there's a whole lot of pressure that people are under to be like everybody else, to be awake at the same time, be at work at the same time, because at some point it's hard to get a sandwich because everything's closed. And so there's some, some a lot of societal pressure to have the same sleep schedule. Um, so if you, you know, uh, if you're in a place that has a different sleep schedule, there's pressure for that. But I think that there's not, like, that's not intrinsically better or worse, in my opinion, but, you know, definitely it can be helpful to, to take it out. Can you really catch up on weekends? Like, if you have five hours, five hours, five hours, and then sleep late on Saturday? Yeah, the sleep binging uh, is, well, it's better than not, but it doesn't really have the same effect because, um, you know, so maybe some of the physiological things you can catch up on, but some of the learning, you just miss that. Um, for some, for th these tasks where they show the learning benefit, if you sleep deprive people and then let them catch up as much as they need, they don't show that learning benefit. So they need to get that um, right away. And also, if you're sleep deprived, uh, there are tr you have problems learning new information. So one analogy that's not uh, not as far off as it could be is like if you have a certain amount of buffer space to learn new information and at some point you have to write that buffer to the disk um, and if you don't have enough sort of space for the free space for that that you clean out during sleep that you just can't learn the new thing or you're going to forget some of the other things you learn so those things you can't make up on by sleeping in on the weekends so I don't know about the uh, the uh, you know things like the beta amyloid and stuff like that I don't think they they've tested that sort of thing but for the learning I think you're doing a lot better if you can uh, get regular sleep during the week or uh, catch naps and things like that. Uh, well, thank you very much, and I'll turn over to the next speaker.